Start with some Shakespeare. Seems appropriate this evening. I have of late, wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercises, and indeed goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave overhanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, why it appeareth nothing to me but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapours. It's easy at this time in our history, political history in this country and our history as a species, to feel rather bleak about the trajectory that we're on. The wonderful book written some years ago by a British nature writer called Richard Maybe called Nature Cure, and he was dealing with some depression in his life, and he was recommending, as many natural historians have over the years, that there was a lot of solace that one could find in celebrating the natural world, immersing oneself in it, recognizing that one is fully a part of nature and the immense evolutionary history of our planet. When we think about natural history, when we think about biological diversity, and this is certainly true of writers like Richard Maybe, uh, we think about textbook images of biological richness like this, this beautiful soft coral reef photographed in Fiji, I think. You've all seen pictures like this with the clownfish. You can't see an anemone there. What I'm going to talk about this evening is biological diversity and the richness of life on a different scale, on the microscopic scale. This is my pond in uh, Oxford, Ohio, not far from Cincinnati. And my stepson and I dug this about 20 years ago, and we dropped a liner in the pond, in the hole, and put some limestone paving around it and put fish in there. And this is my own private Walden. We didn't get any snow this year, so this was photographed last year, and you can see my fish there. Thoreau, in a time of, um, I suppose, interesting time in, in, in American history, too, in the 1850s, um, retreated to Walden Pond and uh, wrote this famous work. And the pond was frozen over. Uh, one that winter, and he walked on the, on the surface of the pond and he brushed away the snow. And he wrote, I looked down into the quiet parlor of fishes, of the fishes, pervaded by a softened light as through a window of ground glass. Heaven is under our feet as well as over our heads. But he was thinking about the frogs and the fish in the pond. And for me, because of my perhaps perverse research interests, um, I really am interested in the microscopic organisms in the pond, and those are the things that I seek out with a microscope. Because as was mentioned in the introduction, we think about the elephant in the room. We are driven by our senses for, for obvious reasons. We look at the big fierce animals, we see the big things, we live with cats and dogs and uh, other members of our species of African ape. And perhaps we see elephants in the zoo. But we're missing most of life. We're missing the life that exists all around us. This immense, pollulating diversity of organisms that are totally invisible unless we magnify them using a microscope. And Humans, we were completely unaware of their, the existence of these tiny forms of life before the invention of the microscope. And I've got this, this picture up in the, the top there in the, uh, up there in the loft of this, um, under the eaves of this, this house here. So that's Amoeba proteus, the beautiful uh, amoeba 
drawn by um, Leedy in the 19th century, beautiful illustrator of tiny organisms. The picture at the top comes from a work that was published in 1637. It's Descartes' Le Dioptric, which was published as an, an appendix, an essay to his Discourse on Reason. If anybody, for those of you that have been to college and you philosophy 101, you looked at uh, Descartes' work. But Descartes was really interested in optics. And this was his design for a microscope that may never have been built, and hopefully it never was. Because if you're sitting close enough to the front here, you'll see that this was a rather disastrous machine that he'd, he'd invented. <laughs> so you can see that, he's, that there's a parabolic mirror, the curved mirror there, that's collecting light from the sun. And the viewer there is pointing this thing at our star. And there's a condensing lens that's focusing the light on the, the specimen, and then you could see the viewer there's looking along the microscope too. I mean, what would happen if such a microscope was ever constructed and used this way? I mean, it'd be like using a telescope today and pointing it at the sun. I mean, you're, you're presumably your retina would be blown out within microseconds and probably the rest of your head. But uh, so this wasn't a practical microscope design that Descartes came up with. But fortunately, other um, very inventive Scientists from the 17th century, Robert Hooke, Lowen Hooke, and others developed microscopes that were um, effective. In fact, probably the first microscope was actually designed by Galileo. He adapted his telescope, had a very unwieldy instrument that was described so right early in the, um, early in the uh, 17th century. And he, he was able to use this to look at, so if there was a fly on the stage here, he could, uh, Galileo could have used his his, his, his adapted telescope to view a fly, and maybe he was getting tenfold magnification, so no greater than we get with a, with, a, with a beautiful hand lens today, a magnifying loop. So this was actually the Goliath microscope, but I digress. When we begin to look at the microscopic world, our view of life changes, and there's a huge amount of information in this unwieldy diagram, and I'm just going to point to a few features in this, this image. So probably in high school biology or in college biology, just, just like me, you were taught about the animal and plant kingdom. Maybe protozoans were mentioned, and then maybe for some of the younger people in the audience, you learned about the fungi. But those, those were the major groupings of organisms. Bacteria added there, the prokaryotes, the things without nuclei. But, but life was, was seen as relatively simple. Um, biological diversity was viewed in relatively simplistic terms until the introduction of uh, a couple of techniques. So first thing I write about this in the book, electron microscopy that enabled scientists to look at cells with, with unprecedented magnification. I mean, potentially hundreds of thousandth uh, X magnification. But more importantly, with the introduction of genetic techniques to, to look at life from a genetic perspective and look at the relationships between different living things. And that's what's shown in this, this diagram. So the wheel on the outside, each of those segments shows a supergrouping of organisms. So this is a grouping of organisms that's bigger than a kingdom bigger than the plant kingdom, bigger than the animal kingdom. But all of life is represented in this diagram other than the most numerous forms of life on Earth, the bacteria and the archaea. So very, very briefly here, we're looking at complicated organisms in the outside of this wheel, things called eukaryotes like us, whose cells have our chromosomes packaged in a nucleus. So we're looking at these eight supergroupings of organisms around the outside, and they're all linked to a common ancestor in the center, and that common ancestor was assembled from bacterial and uh, archaeal components, these very, very simple organisms that, that, that lack nuclei. I hope that isn't too esoteric. But the groups are interesting. If we, if we go around the outside, we can look at, I'll only pick on two groups here. Uh, maybe three. If we look at the alveolates at the bottom, the alveolator, those are 
include the dinoflagellates. And dinoflagellates can be found in seawater. They can be found in, certainly in my pond in Oxford, Ohio, in every body of fresh, fresh water. You can find dinoflagellates. And the one that's shown there is a, at the bottom is a marine thing. And it's actually got an eye sticking out from the side. There's a lens attached to it. You see the black cup at the bottom and then the, the, the lens there. This is a single-celled marine organism that swims around the, off the, the coast of California, among other places. And yet it has this opt sophisticated optical system that it can use for viewing its surroundings. It probably use it for, uses it for escaping from, from its predators. Beautiful experiments were done many years ago where a, 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 an ingenious investigator at uh, Scripps actually dissected out the lenses from these eyes and actually did experiments where they looked at the field of view of the, the eye and sort of imagine you know, holding up the dinoflagella like when one goes for an eye test and you're trying to see how far you can read down the, the list of letters. But he was doing this sort of thing with, the, with this single-celled organism. Fantastic complexity. I'll come back to the dinoflagellates in a second. All of the plants, all of the green stuff, very, very uninteresting plants are all the same thing. They're, they're within the archiplastids, the archiplastida. But there's other things there. There's much greater genetic richness among the green algae that sit in that group. So where are we within this great wheel of life? We sit within a group called the Apistheconta. So this is the last group that I'll talk about here. You can see that at the top left, the Apistheconta. And the Apistheconta includes two great groups of organisms that have been subsumed into this supergroup. And those are all of the animals and all of the fungi. So we belong to the same lineage. This is a fact of life. We share far more of our genetics with the fungi with anything else in that, that great wheel. So we're referred to as, as sister groupings of organisms. So it's fantastic. Everyone in the room here is more closely related to a mushroom than a plant or a dinoflagellate or a rhizarian or one of these other huge groupings of organisms. So this is a radical sort of uh, reinvention, not reinvention because it was there waiting for us all the time, a, a, a radically different new view of life that is supported by a a wealth of information. If we, this is this this some um, there aren't. I think that's probably this is the last diagram that I've got. If we look at the picture on the left, that pie chart, that shows the the number of catalogued species in each of these supergroupings of 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 organisms. Well, each of these groups that are named there, and so these are the organisms for for which species for which there's some description in the scientific literature. So that is a description of us that goes back to Linnaeus, you know, homo sapiens, wise man. If you look at that picture then, the metazoans, those are animals with some multicellular animals. You can see they dominate the picture here. So we focused on the elephants in the room and things like us to understand this. Most of the descriptions of species are of, 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 as you probably know, are descriptions of insects. Maybe about a million insects have been named. The fungi do quite well in this because there's been a lot of fungal taxonomists over the last couple of hundred years. There's 70,000 species of fungi that have been described. And the, the, I apologize for the additional names here, but the streptophytes, those are green plants. But the point being here, if you look at biology according to the taxonomic descriptions, most of life then appears to be animal, plant, and will allow the fungi, my favorite group of organisms, some representation. But if we look at samples of, of water or soil using genetic techniques, the whole picture changes. So if we stop using our senses, our vision particularly, and look at things from a genetic point of view, the picture changes immediately. The biggest group on this list here, so this would be based upon uh, soil samples and samples of fresh water, alveolates, things like dinoflagellates. You could say that this planet is really a, a dinoflagellate planet rather than one that's dominated by animals. This is certainly the case in terms of the genetic richness. This is a completely different view of life. We have been 
misled by our intuition. I mean, you think about, about that, that um, Steve Jones, the science writer that, that, that said that, that, you know, you look at the, look at the sunrise. We, we get up every morning. Well, some of us get up every morning early enough to see the sunrise, and we see the sun rise and move through the sky and then set in the evening. There's only one thing that's wrong with that viewpoint, which is that it's completely wrong. The sun isn't moving at all, but our senses tell us the sun moves. But similarly with biology, we're misled. We're grossly misled. So this is where I grew up. I've lived in this great country and participated in Jefferson's great experiment in democracy since 1986, but I grew up in Oxford in England. Now I live in Oxford, Ohio, which is, there has to be meaning in that. This is where I grew up on the Thames, in the Thames River Valley, and you might see there's some sheep in the field. Actually, there appear to be cows. I've never noticed that before. There are cows in the field there, dairy cows, and we've got the river. When you look at a beautiful picture like that, what do you see? You see the plants, green plants, and we can see the cattle in the field. You don't see anything else. And then I have to show this picture, since if you type in Big Muddy into Google image, this is the best of the high resolution images that comes up. But again, here we can see the trees and not much else in that picture. But the life within that fresh water is so beautiful and so fascinating and so rich genetically and from I mean, a single milliliter of that, that water from the Big Muddy would contain easily a million cells. And most of those would be bacterial cells, but there would also be cells from those more complicated organisms represented in that, that wheel of um, of life that I showed you. River Thames is 215 miles long. The Missouri, 2,300 miles. Impressive. You do rivers properly in this country. <laughs> Probably Mark Twain said that. Might have done. The diversity in the water is actually unknowable. So with very, very sophisticated techniques now, of sequencing techniques, of, of taking samples of, for example, water, and amplifying the DNA from those samples, and uh, engaging in what's called metagenomic analysis. You can figure out relatively swiftly, where well, you can come up with lots and lots of hits. You can see what, uh, uh, what signatures of different groups of organisms, different species are present in your, your water sample. The problem is, though, that with the immense numbers of organisms in water samples, and even just in my, my pond at, at home, we really don't have the technology to completely document what's there. We're still missing an awful lot of stuff in the environment. And for scientists that, that work on these um, problems, there are beautiful studies that are published every year with wholly new groups of microscopic things have never been seen before. There was a new group of fungi that was, was discovered, a new large group of fungi, a whole phylum of things. I mean, a phylum is a big group of organisms. We belong to the phylum chordata, which includes everything from sea squirts to us. Of course, we're at the pinnacle of that, 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 uh, that continuum of excellence. But this whole group of fungi was discovered in freshwater samples, never seen before. Um, they were even found in chlorinated drinking water, in, in, um, or their DNA was, in, in, in Europe, in France. They were found in, in sand, in seawater. They'd never been seen before because the, the, the probes, the, 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 the way that they were fishing for that DNA was, was really inadequate. But once they changed their techniques, a whole new group of organisms was discovered. And, and that was pretty spectacular finding, but there's more of this information to be found. Our picture of life is so inadequate. We still don't possess the techniques to amplify everything in a water sample from, from a river or from my pond at home. 
You could sequence away till the end of time and you still wouldn't have tapped everything that was there. You got lots of copies of the same thing, but we don't know for sure. So biology at this point in the 21st century, there is still a huge amount that's unknown. There are remarkable, spectacular things to be discovered, probably whole new groups of microorganisms that we haven't dreamed of yet. So I'm gonna talk in for the next part of the talk about the fungi. And so I started off with this goodly frame, the earth, talking about terra firma, and we'll include rivers in that. But then I talked about, from Hamlet, this most excellent canopy, the sky. So that's what I wanna focus on, which is why there's that subtitle to the second part of the title here, mushrooms in the sky, the fungus in the sky. So picture on the left there shows uh, what's called a phylogenetic tree. It shows the evolutionary relationships between different groups of organisms, and it makes the point that the fungi and the animals are somewhat closely related, more closely related than either group is to the plants. And there's a timeline along the bottom, so the genetic evidence suggests that, that we, animals, shared a common ancestor with the fungi around about a billion years ago, plus or minus a few months, and then... We split, plus or minus, what is it there? A few uh, tens of hundreds of millions of years, right? So a long, long time ago, in the beginning, fungi and animals, we shared an ancestor. Then we split, and then we were, we were off to the races to become the greatest thing in the universe. The greatest solipsists. The only solipsists. I don't know, cats are solipsistic too, aren't they? They think they're, cats think they rule the world. They do, don't they? Cats rule the world. In my household, the cats rule the world. They're very ungrateful, too. <laughs> but I, I digress. So the fungi, the fungi seen in the... It, so if we take the fungi, so they're just one part of that epistocont group, and then we blow that out into the different groupings of organisms, uh, different um, phyla. You can see here the Pisidiomycetes, the Ascomycetes. So you might have heard of some of these groups, particularly the Pisidiomycetes that include the things that form mushrooms, and the Ascomycetes that include brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces, Cerevisiae. So those are the two big groups of fungi. All right, so just before you came into the room, um, I took an air sample and looked at it under the microscope, and this is what we're all breathing in right now. <laughs> this most excellent canopy. So this is the asthmatics nightmare. <laughs> but this is an air sample um, from Oklahoma, as it happens. And it shows lots and lots of fungal spores. So the air appears, and this is a, a good way of illustrating this overall idea, the main point of this talk, which is there's a lot more going along uh, on than we can you know, see most obviously, amoeba in the room, that, that the air is full of fungal spores and other particles full of bacteria. The big things that are shown here, the pretty things from my viewpoint are these fungal spores, many, many different species that are here. And here's a surprising fact. There are 50 million tons of fungal spores that are ejected into Earth's atmosphere every year. 50 million tons, that is equal to roughly Avogadro's number of particles, 10 to the 23. 50 million tons of stuff is ejected into the atmosphere every year. And, and how do we know that? We know that because of some beautiful work by German atmospheric chemists, and I don't know how much I'll get into this, but there are certain signatures, certain chemicals that are carried on fungal spores that aren't carried on anything else. And so they can actually measure the quantity of those chemicals, the sugar alcohols in the atmosphere, and from that they can calculate this immense number of, that this immense number of spores exists. I did a calculation recently based on this 50 million ton figure, and thinking about the average size of the spore, spores, and came up with a surface area of 31 million kilometers. 
of fungal spores that are stuffed up into the atmosphere every year. That's equivalent to the land area of Africa, the African continent. So that's an awful lot of surface on which some really interesting chemistry can occur. And the other thing is that fungal spores are only released from environments where there's a lot of plant activity. Most fungi feed on plant materials. So there are no fungal spores going up above the ocean. Well, there are very, very few of them. But they're going up there from forests and grasslands, from agricultural land. So that's an awful lot of stuff that's going up there. So how do they get up there? This is a pretty, pretty diagram drawn by my colleague Mark Fisher. And it shows the different mechanisms that ascomycete fungi, so these are things that are related to brewer's yeast, yeast that carries out fermentation in wine and beer, and that actually use a, an active mechanism for spitting these particles into the air. And they do this because this is their mechanism of dispersal. It allows them to forge out of a new territory, establish new colonies, eat new things, mate, produce new spores, like we all do. It's the way that life works. So this is the way that they migrate. But they use these mechanisms, they're, 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 many of them are referred to as squirt guns. They generate pressure in what I've shown here with that blue colored fluid, and then they spit their spores into the air. And when I was more active a few years ago in the, in the lab, um, what I did with my students at Miami University is that we were looking at the, the mechanisms that drove these little particles into the air at, the, at immense speeds. And we were using cameras that were running up to a million frames a second, so capturing a single digital image every millionth of a second. And you could, you, could, you could run this thing for at a buffer. I could explain how it works. But you run it for a few seconds, you'd get an immense amount of information, and then you'd kill almost all of your hard drive, and you'd end up with a few frames of interest. And what they showed is the way that these spores move into the air. I'm just going to show you a couple of things here. ka -ching. So there's a few millionths of a second of information. Totally invisible to the naked eye. Nobody could see this. It's all over within a few millionths of a second. Look at that one. That one at the bottom is the fastest one that's ever been recorded. 32 meters a second. That's 115 kilometers an hour from something that's less than a tenth of a millimeter in length. Look at it again. Just being spat into the air. Amazing. Totally invisible. You can only see this using a very sophisticated camera. And, um, they used actually similar cameras. I don't know how many of you saw the movie, um, The Hurt Locker, that was produced some years ago. They used very high-speed cameras to capture some of those very disturbing images of explosions. So I want to focus on, so that, those, were the, those were examples of the way that some of these ascomycete fungi spit their spores into the air. But I want to focus on the basidiomycetes, because you're just going to love this. I almost do not it's a Trumpy thing, isn't it, Mr. Mr. Trump, President? <laughs> I keep thinking about the fact that he's giving his probably giving his speech right right now. This is the same. We're all participating in Jefferson's great experiment. We the people. As uh, Basidium eat fungi. All right. So mushrooms. Everybody loves mushrooms, right? So here's a mushroom, beautiful photograph here, shows the spores swirling away from the cap of an ink cap here. A single mushroom like this releases 30,000 spores a second. That's a rather large number of particles, is it not? But that in part accounts for, explains how we can possibly get 50 million tons of spores thrown up into the atmosphere every year. Mushrooms produce an immense number of spores. So you can actually see this for yourselves if you use a flashlight in, at night or in a dark room, put a flashlight behind a mushroom, you'll actually see the spores swirling away from the cap. And we're inhaling these spores. We're doing it now, there's spores in this, this room. 
not necessarily from mushrooms, not at this time of year, but there are spores of other fungi that are here. If we look at the gills of a mushroom, as um, a scientist called David McLaughlin did at the end of the 1970s, you this beautiful picture of a mushroom gill. It was a gorgeous. These, these structures look like little cow udders, and each of them supports four spores. And those spores are shot off the surface of the gill, they fall between the gills, and then they're wafted away, blown away by air currents. So to tell you this story, I need to tell you a little bit about how that works. But before I do that, I'm going to give you a little bit of, of history of this part of history of microbiology here. The first person that saw those structures on the mushroom gill was a scientist on the top left called Anton Michaeli, who wrote an extremely important book called the Nova Plantarum Genera in 1729. And he worked in Florence. And his statue, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Florence, but if you go to Florence, you can go to the Uffizi Museum. And outside the Uffizi, there's this colonnade with these beautiful statues about life size of all of the greats of Florentine science and letters. And the person that you can't see clearly on the, the, the uh, left of Michele is Galileo. But there are other people up there, Dante, for example, um, many others. But the, the um, Florentines regarded Michele as a genius. Unfortunately, they did so after his death. But um, they erected his statue and celebrated his life there. And he's holding the Nova Plantarum Genera in, the, in, his, in his right hand. The picture that's in the middle at the top there is his, his first picture of mushroom gills using a, a dreadful microscope. He was a very poor scholar. He was, was always trying to get funding for his, his researches. He was sort of poorly recognized at the time. Linnaeus couldn't stand him. Linnaeus, who was describing all of these species. And he died in 1737 on a mushroom collecting trip. He got uh, contracted pleurisy and passed away for his, his field. But um, he also, by the way, disturbed, he um, did away with the idea of spontaneous generation more than a century before Pasteur. But because his work was unrecognized, we all know about Pasteur, and very few people know about Michele. So. The other people there in, the, um, in this picture, there are also people that studied mushroom spores. And the person in the, the bottom left there is um, Reginald Buller, who's my, my hero, who's probably one of the strangest scientists that ever existed. Um, he was born in Britain, and he moved to the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg in the early part of the 20th century. And he lived in yeah, kind of shabby hotel rooms for his entire adult life. He didn't marry. He um, didn't want the trappings, so he said, of a, of a married life. And he dedicated 40 years day in and day out studying fungi. And he wrote a series of books called The Researches on Fungi, um, seven volumes. And it was his main regret when he was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor that, that he wouldn't get to finish the seventh volume. He, he just, this was his life, totally dedicated to, to his studies. He was a very, very strange man. He lost more hair as he, as he got older. And I actually spoke to a gentleman some years ago who might have been the last living connection with Buller. He'd been a student of, of, of Buller's, or maybe he'd gotten it secondhand, because Buller was still teaching in, in Manitoba in the 90s. 1940s, early 1940s, and apparently they went out to the, 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 the high Arctic on some botanical expedition, and Buller had a, had a bald head, as I mentioned, and he was demonstrating, he was talking about these plants out on the tundra with a group of students around him, and suddenly there was a screech, and out of the sky came an eagle that latched on his head, stuck his ta its talons into his scalp, and Buller was left bleeding in the Arctic while this, this, this bird then flew off and it picked him presumably because his head was shinier than the heads of his students. But things like this happened to, to Buller. He led a, uh, 
um, a charmed but bizarre life. Very interesting man. He studied fungal spores and um, he was actually in this experiment here, he was actually studying the rate at which fungal spores fall through air. So this is a typical example of something that shouldn't be funded by federal dollars, right? Only the work was actually very pertinent because he was the first person that verified Stokes' law, which is, describes the rate of, of descent, the rate of sedimentation of particles um, in air. He was the first person to apply this on a microscopic level, and this is actually really important in understanding the way that clouds form, for example. So his work was of, actually of immense um, scientific significance. He studied rust fungi that were wiping out the uh, wheat crops in that part of Manitoba at that time, you know, before the use of, of um, synthetic fungicides. Uh, many of his studies were absolutely critical to cereal agriculture. Who else have we got here? Um, everybody that studies fungi and, and other microorganisms is, is, is perhaps very strange, and I can't extract myself from that uh, analysis. Guy at the top right, look at him, Terence Ingold. I'm going to go around here. Um, 1905 to 2010. Very, very long life. Um, I got to know him. He studied fungal spores for more than 70 years. He wrote a book in 1976 um, that, you know, for most people would have been sort of the end of career book, and then, but he went on to live for decades and decades and decades. And I, I asked him when he was almost 100, um, you know, to what he ascribed his longevity, and I was hoping that he'd say, you know, take this every day. Because <laughs> he was very spry at 100, astonishing, astonishing. But he just said, genes. Probably right. So he studied fungal spores. Elsie Wakefield, um, very important female scientist that um, studied mating reactions between, between fungi, and she went against all of the orthodoxy at the time in her studies, but she went on to be the director of, um, of mycology, of the study of fungi at Kew in, 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 in London for, oh, better part of 40 years. So extremely influential scientist. And John Webster, another person that uh, another very important scientist that studied fungal spores. So you probably got everybody on that slide other than me that's really interested in this topic. This is kind of what they discovered, that this is the way fungal spores get off surfaces. How do they actually get ejected from a gill surface? Well, the way that it works is that water condenses on their surface, and it condenses in two separate drops. You can see them here. Buller's drop, named after the great Arthur Henry Reginald Buller, and then this adaxial drop. And when those drops reach a certain size, so they're, 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 water's accumulating, condensing, they reach a certain size and they touch one another. And just like water droplets that are running down your windshield, when they touch one another, they snap together. There's a saving in, in surface free energy. Energetically, this, this makes sense for drops of water to jump onto one another, to jump together. And the reason that water condenses there is because that the spores actually leak sugars onto their surface, sugar alcohols onto their surface. And so in that very humid environment between, between a mushroom gill, between mushroom gills, water condenses. It's like on a bathroom mirror in the morning in the bathroom, having a shower. Not really like that, but it's condensation of water. <laughs> And when the two droplets jump together, there's a massive change, massive. There's a, there's a change in the center of mass, and the spore jumps from its little post. And that happens 30,000 times a second on the surface of the gills of a single mushroom, gets them to fall between the gills. There's nothing else like this in nature. Miraculous and beautiful mechanism. That surface tension thing it's, it's um, excuse me, that, 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 that movement in the center of mass is, is, is a microscopic form of, of a jump. That's all that's happening here. So when, when we leap into the air, as I'll now demonstrate with a massive six foot leap into the air, but what we're doing when we crouch like that, center of mass is being dropped. All you're doing then with your immense musculature, in my case, is to make that center of mass go up half a quarter of a meter. And to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You jump into the air. It's just what a fungal spore's doing. 
It's just this, this, but it's doing it through this movement of fluid. So the droplets of fluid weigh as much as the spore itself. Intriguing mechanism. I gave a talk about, about this um, some years ago, a um, couple of years ago at Messiah College, which is a, a Moravian Christian school in uh, Pennsylvania. And um, I was talking about the, the, the beauty of this mechanism, talking in more detail than this about how it actually works. And there was a very bright student that was sitting at, sitting at the front, and um, he had a great question. He said, this is so immensely complicated. He said, this has to be intelligent design. So what I'd, 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 I'd been in three, you know, I'd, I'd enthralled the audience with this description of this sort of mechanistic sophistication. But I thought that was pretty, that was pretty good. That was a good one. He saw the hand of God where I saw the hand of natural selection. So just to show you how this works at the microscopic level, if you use a high-speed camera, you can see the spore here and the dro droplet and these... Let's just watch that one go at the top. See the droplet actually jump onto the spore? So, you know, just a few millionths of a second of information here. Although this camera was running at 100,000 frames a second. See there the spore. Just think about this happened 30,000 times a second on the surface of mushroom gills. The world is so full of such beautiful things. Invisible until you look at them with a high-speed camera. I, marvelous. All right. So how does this relate to, to us? It's a good picture, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You want to eat it? No. no? Well, it's a safe one. It's, it's um, um, agaricus campestris, meadow mushroom. <coughs> Increasingly rare. You used to see them everywhere. We have on unimproved grassland. You'd have them here outside Kansas City, I expect. So showing you the, 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 the gills of the mushroom, if you, if you take a gill mushroom and put it face down on some paper, you get a beautiful spore print because this happens, it continues to release its spores, 30,000 spores a second. In fact, you know, your very active mushroom, a print like this will develop in, you can see, you know, less than an hour. Immense numbers of spores. So, Think about these spores, this, these huge numbers of things, all of the mushrooms of the world, but all of the ascomycetes and everything else, and all of the indoor molds flinging their spores into the air, you know, millions of tons of spores, massive surface area for some interesting chemistry. What might happen when they get into the, into the air? What I wondered um, a couple of years ago was, given that these spores have got sugars on their surface, after they're ejected into the atmosphere, might they, being, be, might they engage in some interesting interactions, interesting uh, interactions with the surrounding air, particularly above a forest where there's lots and lots of spores, very, very dense accumulation of spores above a forest. And so I had a very talented student called Maribeth Hassett, who she just graduated. Um, and so we worked together for a couple of years on, on this project, and I'll just show you the, just give you the, 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 the bones of this. Um, so what she found in her work was that after the spores are released, if you just let a mushroom drop its spores onto a surface, and if you place them in a very humid environment, they'll actually grow droplets, and they'll keep doing this, which is, sounds very simple, which I suppose it is, but it's just that in a very humid environment, they will act in this fashion and they'll grow droplets of water. She did these experiments using an instrument called an environmental scanning electron microscope, which you can use to look at microscopic things and you can hold the temperature at a very, very precise level and change the, um, change the relative humidity in the, the sample chamber. And when she did this, it's an individual mushroom spore, and it's growing a droplet of water. You see this in this, this picture here, some different spores from a, an Ohio mushroom, and you can see ABC in the top, and it's growing a droplet of water. DEF, different species, droplets of water growing on the surface. So even though these things can't be flicked anywhere anymore, they're, they're just in the atmosphere, they're still 
chemically active, they can still generate droplets of water. And what she found was that she could control the size of these droplets just by shifting the humidity in this, this microscope. So the green trace there shows the, the humidity in the microscope, and you can see that as she changes the humidity, as she increases it, the blue trace shows the diameter of the droplets that these droplets of water form, and then as the humidity decreases, as she dials that back essentially, the, the size of the droplet decreases, so she can keep doing this. It's a reproducible phenomenon. The size of these droplets is quite interesting too because they, um, they get quite big, but when you get a number of spores that are clo close together, if you look at that picture C there, you've got, what have we got, F five or six, six spores there in that, that picture, and they've all grown droplets, but they're beginning to actually touch one another and condense and make these larger droplets. And those droplets are along round about the size that one would say sort of 10 micrometers and a uh, millionth of a, of, of a meter and above, which is a size that we, we refer to, or atmospheric chemists refer to, scientists refer to as, as um, uh, cloud condensation nuclei. So the idea here is a simple one based on these observations. There's another spoil, beautiful droplet, beautiful droplets of fluid. Let's just show one more. Number that's pretty pathetic that they just grew a few drops. So the idea here is that is as follows: that the spores initially then accumulate water on their surface, and that this is this is the mechanism that they use to flick themselves off surfaces. But then when they're airborne, and think about the fact that there's millions of tons of these things in the air, when they're in a humid environment, they can actually condense water again and form these larger droplets. This represents, or, or at least supports the case for some causal relationship between the presence of spores in high concentrations and actually ge the generation of rain within rain clouds. There's a lot that's not understood about the dynamics of water movement within clouds. Some beautiful work published last year in um, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, Sciences where um, I think it might have been German researchers then, maybe it was a joint group with an Amer American researchers, um, where they're actually flying aircraft through rain clouds and using las lasers to actually image the tiny droplets of water in clouds and trying to actually see the process of rain formation. I mean, you'd think that rain clouds were, you know, we, this was completely understood at this point. But in fact, it's not. That conversion from the, the vapor phase to the liquid phase is very, very important in cloud seeding, and it seems plausible, at least, that, that these fungal spores, at least in some environments where there's very, very high concentrations of, of spores, because um, they're not equally distributed over the surface of the, the Earth then, that they could be involved in the formation of rain, which I think is, and that's why I wanted to mention it this evening, I think it's one nice example of the way in which life unseen, microscopic life, can perhaps have a profound effect upon our lives in ways that one would never have imagined. And whether we are here or have gone forever, gilled mushrooms will cast their spores into the breeze and miss the blue skies of Earth, so pregnant with clouds. That's what I have for you this evening. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening.